Good evening. Stupid in America. That's a nasty title, but as the new school year begins, it's important to face up to the fact that some nasty things are going on in America's public schools. We see so many movies showing us wild kids. Kids arriving at school doped up. Who was Joan of Arc? The movies tell us the kids are stupid. Noah's wife? <laughs> The Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate... And the teachers, boring. Anyone? Anyone? Are real teachers that dull? Students told us, yes. Some teachers are very boring, so everybody falls asleep. And is school as bad as the movies suggest? You see kids all the time walking into school smoking weed, you know? It's, it's a normal thing here. Normal, kids say here at Abraham Lincoln High in New York. Four years have been miserable in this school. It's like a hellhole. A hellhole? Really? Makes me want to know more. But it's hard to get our cameras into schools. New York City's school district wouldn't allow us in at all. Washington, D.C.'s district steered us to the best classrooms, like this one taught by Jason Cameras, who was National Teacher of the Year. We have 24 positives and 10 negatives. Draw it out. Oh, yeah. This is nice, and there are many outstanding teachers. But we wanted to tape typical classrooms. We were turned down in state after state. Finally, Washington, D.C. did allow us to give cameras to a few students they handpicked at two schools they handpicked. One was this one, Woodrow Wilson High. Newsweek says it's one of the best schools in America. Yet what the students taped wasn't confidence inspiring. This is Wilson High School. We dance. Note that the teacher's in the class when he does this. You would say, well, it's a game. On that day, this teacher had his world geography class playing Monopoly. Right now, we're going to ask Mr. Greiner what Monopoly has to do with world geography. Like Monopoly, we have countries that do better than others based on where you live. <laughs> it was after finals, and I don't know if Monopoly can help teach geography. But I do know that this teacher didn't have much control over his class. Phil, get off the desk and sit in your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up. Let's look Mr. At Greiner, it. raise your hand. That's it's hard to believe you can learn hand. much while this is going so on. Guys who are talking, stop. Please. Oh, no. Hey, listen. And this is one of America's no, best there. public schools. Put the dice away. Now, you may be thinking, these things don't happen at my kid's school. 57% of American parents give an A or B grade to their kid's public school. The people in the suburbs say our schools are great. But they're not. That's the thing, and the test scores show that. Some Education reformer Kevin Chavis says American schools on the whole just aren't that good. And America isn't going to buy that. America's not going to buy America's that. America's been buying Because America doesn't know what it doesn't know. Right. Most Americans don't know what stupid schools are doing to American kids. We gave parts of an international test to some high school students in Belgium and in New Jersey. Answer the questions to the best of your ability. What the Belgian kids think? Considering the test we usually get here, um, well, this was kind of a piece of cake. It's very easy. The New Jersey kids were also confident. How was the test? Easy? Hard? It was actually pretty easy. I think I did good. They have reason to be confident. New Jersey students in general test above average. And these kids were at an above average New Jersey school. But the Belgian kids cleaned their clocks. They got 76% correct. You got 47% correct. I'm shocked, because it just shows how much advanced they are compared to us. This boy got the highest score among the Americans, but didn't come close to the top-scoring Belgians. The test was so easy. I think that if the kids in America couldn't do this, they're really stupid. What's the purpose of the Bill of Rights? Um, I don't know. What was a major cause of the Civil War? I don't know. American high school kids are beaten on the international tests, not just by kids from Belgium, but by kids from most countries, even poorer ones like Poland, the Czech Republic, South Korea. So are American students stupid? No, we're not stupid, but we just, we could do better. I think it has to be something with this, this school, because I don't think we're stupid or lower than them. Right, something with the school, because the longer kids spend in American schools, the worst they do. Fourth graders take international tests, and at that age, American kids do well above average. But by high school, they've fallen way behind. Are the kids stupid? The kids are not stupid. The system is stupid. 
These parents and grandparents are furious at what they've learned about their kids' public schools. It's a joke. It's insane. They're not learning anything. Pam Van Goren, who used to be a teacher, was appalled when her granddaughter came to stay with her. She can barely add and subtract numerals one through five. She was with me for a week. She's reading fluently when she goes back, and she knows her math facts one through what, 20. In one week, you taught yes. her what the school couldn't teach yeah. her in months? What's going on? So what is going on? Well, the schools say they need more money. Do they? What's the biggest problem facing public schools? Money. That's what everyone says. Lack of money. At this California rally, teachers told us schools need much more money. There's nothing that yeah. money can't fix. In Massachusetts, parents baked cookies and sold all sorts of things. To raise money for a school system that is desperately trying to make ends meet. More money, please, say the South Carolina school officials. How much money would be right? How much? Ooh, millions. And it would really make it right. They're spending 10000 per kid now. 15000 20000 20000 25000 30 The more, the better. The more, the better. That was the thinking years ago when a judge ordered more must be spent on Kansas City schools. So they did. Two billion dollars more. <laughs> Kansas City built this Olympic-sized swimming pool, state-of-the-art gyms with indoor track, these computer labs, and more. They had so much money that when they wanted to bring in more white kids, they didn't just bust them. The Kansas City district used about 120 taxis. But the result of all this spending on student achievement? It got worse. By 2000, Kansas City schools failed to meet any of the state's standards, and they lost their accreditation. If money were the solution, the problem would already be solved. Jay Green is the author of Education Myths. We've doubled per pupil spending, adjusting for inflation, over the last 30 years, and yet schools aren't better. Adjusted for inflation? Adjusted for inflation. We now spend more than $10,000 per pupil per year. Here's a graph of the increased spending. The line goes straight up, but student achievement, flat. Graduation rates, flat. The extra money didn't help the kids. How can that be? More money, but no results? It's a lot of money. Think about it, $10,000 per student. For a classroom of 25, that would be $250,000 per year. Where does the money go? You can give public schools all the money in America, and it will not be enough. Everyone has been conned. I'm not doing it today, okay? Ben Chavis is a former public school principal who now runs this alternative school that spends thousands of dollars less per student. He laughs at the public school's complaints about money. They all say it's the answer. No, it's not. We just need a little more money. That is the biggest lie in America. They waste money. To save, Chavis asked the students to do things like keeping the grounds picked up and setting up for lunch. We don't have full-time janitor. Um, we don't have security guards. We don't have computers. We don't have a cafeteria staff. Thanks, Dom. Man. There's no pool or world-class gym. Hey, on your mark, get set, go. For gym class, his students often just run laps around the block. If you come to school, you're going to have the advantage over everyone else. When you it means there's more money left over for teaching. Is that a complete sentence or a fragment? Even spending less money per student, Chavis pays his teachers more than public school teachers get. His school also thrives because the principal gets involved. Chavis shows up at every classroom and uses gimmicks like small cash payments for perfect attendance. Do you come to school for the money or do you come to school to get an education? Education. And the money. Since he took over four years ago, this school has gone from being among the worst in Oakland to being one of the best. Last year, his middle school had the highest test scores in the city. You boosted the scores from where they were by spending less money. It's not about the money. But what about kids who've come from broken families, poor families? Give me the poor kids, and I will outperform the wealthy kids who live in the hills. And we do it. PR. Other spunky independent schools do well with less money, like this one in South Carolina run by Teresa Middleton. We saw that the kids here were enthusiastic about learning. My children are so excited. Can we play this today? Can we do popcorn? Can we do relay math? Can we play bingo? Can we play phonics around the world? <laughs> Learning should be fun. And fun seems to teach. These first graders can read. Get 
ready to work, work, work. I've had three-year-olds sounding out words. My below average child can go to public school and make the honor roll. Yet she spends only $3,000 per child versus the $9,000 South Carolina's public schools spend and still fail to educate students like Dorian Kane. My son is now 18 and he is not reading. He's on a fourth grade level and it's a huge problem. We want to take a shot at that. Dorian struggles to read just one sentence in this first grade book. One day Uncle Jack came to visit. He says he wants to learn to read. You know, there is a whole world that can open up to you if you are able to read. Yeah, I know that. Did they try to teach you to read? From time to time. Can I even have a seat? So we decided we'd send Dorian to a private learning center, Sylvan. Could they teach Dorian to read when the South Carolina public schools hadn't? All right, click on OK for me. You bet. After just 72 hours of instruction using computers and workbooks, Dorian's reading was up more than two grade levels. His mother loves the private program. They are doing what they're supposed to do. They are on point, but I can't say the same for the public schools. No, she can't. South Carolina over 12 years spent nearly $100,000 on Dorian's education, but they left him behind. If you're a parent with money, you have choices. You can pay for a private school or buy into a neighborhood that has a better public school. Kids! Kids! Wait! A real estate agency even runs commercials about it. Anyone know the student per teacher ratio in your classroom? They show a mother to be desperate to find a good school. She's crazy. No, she's not. In San Jose, California, parents want to get their kids into Fremont Union schools. They're so much better than neighboring schools that parents sometimes cheat to get their kids in. What's cheating? Pretending to live in the district when you don't. Inspector John Lozano goes door to door to check if kids really live where they say they live. Is uh, here? Yeah. Really? Oh, great. Nice to finally meet you. How long you guys been here? Then Lozano says About he still now? needs to look okay. inside the house you know to make sure room. she really lives there. I don't mean to embarrass you, so... He sounds nice, but think about yeah, what he's doing. The school room. district police go into your daughter's bedroom. He even room. goes through drawers and closets okay. if he has to. Well, we have a computer. We have some Seventeen magazines. We have pictures of the student and her friends on the wall. This girl passes. I was looking for... But the grandmother who listed this address is caught. Haunt? People well, who the answer the door say is, she doesn't she live here. She says that she lives here and that her grandson's gonna live here with her. That's so they can go to school at Homestead High School. Oh, I have two, yeah. yeah. Two caught, she's definitely caught. And two days later, I talked to the work. grandmother. I was actually crying. It's kind of creepy that they force you to go to the black market to get your kid a better education. I was crying in front of this 14 years old. Why can't they just let parents get in the school of their choice? Why can't they? Petty Bowers kids through something called McKay scholarships have been allowed to leave public school to attend this private school where their grades are better and they're much happier. But the politics of McKay scholarships are unsettled and her kids may be forced back into public school. If they take the McKay scholarship away, I don't think, I'm sorry. I don't think Joey will finish school. Why can't she choose her child's school? Most countries that beat America on international tests give parents that choice. There were a few people who got very, very high scores. And, Here in Belgium, the government spends less than American schools do on each student, but the money's attached to the kids, so they can go wherever they want, to a state-run school, or a Catholic school, or a Muslim, or a Montessori school. Because of that choice, it makes it a lot harder for schools because there's a lot of pressure. Kate Van den Sabel so runs a state school in Belgium. Uh, she says because the money is attached to the kids, she has to please the parents, and that makes a world of difference. If we don't offer them what they want for their child, they won't come to our school. So she provides extras like cooking, more sports programs, furniture building, electronics. Is this what you like best? Yeah. You uh, think that uh, America doesn't leave any child behind. But um, I think that we don't leave any child behind and that you guys have some kind of a problem with that. 
I wouldn't send my child to an American public school, not even for a million dollars. Her son lives in Belgium now, but when he was six, his family lived in America, and his mom was upset when he was assigned to a school. In America, I sort of had to beg, please, please uh, give me a good school for my child. And here in Belgium, uh, they're all over the place. Because if they're not good, they're gone. You shut down bad schools. That's healthy. Because it says to people that, that, that incompetence won't work. So the fact that some schools fail and close, that's, that's the success of That's choice? a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a real good what thing. What happens to those kids in those schools? Then they'll go to another school. Why should we keep them in a school that's not working? That's what we've been doing for decades. Giving kids a choice forces schools to try harder. You have to be innovative all the time. You have to look for new means of working, new means of thinking. Onions, ham, and salami. So if we don't succeed, we just run out of business. I think it's a pity that American children don't have the same opportunities and, and same uh, choices as we have, but um, if you're used to it, maybe it's just normal. No choice is just normal in America. Why are you watching us? You don't have to. You have choices. But suppose you had only one channel and the government told you what you had to watch. That's generally how it works for schools. <laughs> When the Sanford family moved from Charleston to Columbia, South Carolina, they had a big concern. Where would their kids go to school? First thing I did was look up on the computer, where are we zoned? What schools would those be? You have to go where you're zoned. You go where you're zoned. In South Carolina and most everywhere, you must attend the public school in the zone where you live. But the middle school near the Sanford's new home was rated below average. It turned out, however, this wasn't a problem for them because the reason they were moving to Columbia was that Mark had just been elected governor. Duly installed as governor of South Carolina. So they were offered special options. People from better school districts invited them to send their kids oh, to those schools. And I said, but that's not fair, because if I lived down the street here, they wouldn't be allowed to do that. Would I be allowed to do that? And they said, no, you would not. He said, but we're going to waive that requirement because you're the governor. And, and the, I said, that's not fair. It's not fair, but that's often how it works in America. As we showed you, the kids of the privileged can escape bad schools by moving to where the better schools are. If you could buy a two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand dollar house, you're going to get some great public education. But most everyone else is stuck with what the government gives you. Been in a public school system, no matter how much you complain about it, no matter how much you you cry about what's going on with your children, your children are stuck because of their zip code. These South Carolina parents say their kids' public schools were bad. They don't teach them the kids. If you hadn't pulled them out of the public schools. I think it would have ruined his life. Dale's grandson said some of his public school teachers helped him pass tests by telling him to cheat. They were giving him the answers? They were giving him the answers, and he said they're teaching me to cheat so they could pass him on to the next grade. The no child left behind thing, you know. Send him on up to the next class. Get him out of here. They really did not care. Lizzie Murphy's son was in kindergarten for a year without learning the basics of writing. He just learned to write his name, and that's through me telling him that an M is a hump hump. A kindergarten can barely write his name. What's going on? What are you doing? What are they doing? If you compare SAT scores state by state, South Carolina ranks last. I want to tell you that if you look at every indicator for South Carolina schools, South Carolina is not last. Inez Tenenbaum has been state superintendent for schools since 1998. We have been ranked as having some of the highest standards of learning in the entire country. Well, maybe we you own, set high standards, but the kids don't achieve them. We are ranked number one in the country for improvement on SAT. But 32 points. if you start points. at the bottom, it's easier to improve. You've improved and you're still last. SAT is a, uh, an indicator that really shouldn't be used to judge any state. We're making tremendous progress in South Carolina and we're very proud. Why be proud? Half the kids who start high school in South Carolina don't graduate in four years. And the state's first family was afraid to send their kids to the school they were zoned for. It's too important to me to sacrifice their education. I get one shot at it. If I don't pay very close attention to how my boys get educated, then I've lost an opportunity to make them the best they can be in this world. They decided to send their kids to private school. 
And the governor then proposed giving every parent in South Carolina that kind of choice. Does one size ever fit all? He said state tax credits should help parents pay for private schools. Then they would have a choice. Choice is external pressure. The public has to know that there's an alternative there. It's just like, you know, do you get a Sprint phone or an AT&T phone? He's right. When monopolies rule, little gets done. Think about where we wait in line the longest. At monopolies, the motor vehicles department, the post office, or the extreme example, the former Soviet Union. People waited in line an average two hours every day, five years over a lifetime. In this Moscow restaurant, I waited endlessly while waiters sat or talked to each other because with no competition, there's no incentive to wait on me. In America, the phone company was once a government-supported monopoly. All the phones were black and all the calls expensive. It was illegal to plug in an answering machine. Installing a foreign device, the monopoly called it. So the next time you complain about your phone service... This clip from Saturday Night Live is a good description of monopoly service. We don't care. We don't have to. We're the phone company. But take away monopoly status and poof, suddenly customers matter. Your choice of cool phones. Think about the choices competition gives you when you buy a cell phone. Can you hear me now? There are dozens of plans to choose from based on how many minutes you want, how big your family is, and a million other things. Great deal on a cool phone. Why can't kids benefit from similar competition in education? People expect and demand choice in every other area of their life. Letting parents choose, he said, would encourage schools to compete. And they'd quickly offer parents things like music schools, schools with uniforms, schools that open earlier, keep kids later, virtual schools where kids learn on the internet, sports schools, then who knows what ideas might bloom. It empowers parents, it will ultimately improve education. The governor announced his plan last year, and thousands of parents cheered the idea. But most public educators and politicians didn't. School boards objected, teachers unions objected, PTAs even sent kids home with a letter saying, contact your legislator. How could we spend state money on something that hasn't been proven? It would decimate public education in South Carolina, and it's just not good for us. South Carolina's public schools are performing well. The teachers' union objects to any program that would use tax credits or vouchers to let kids escape public schools. They paid for ads that argued schools are getting better. Discipline is improving. Legislators voted down the governor's plan 60 to 53. Victory. The superintendent of schools was relieved. It was an unproven, unaffordable, and unaccountable plan. Well, it's unproven because politicians and unions won't let anyone try it. I think if you look at every indicator, you will see that South Carolina is going straight up in terms of academic achievement. We are not in crisis. We have a plan. We need to stay the course, and we will see remarkable success over the next few years. I hope so. But how much success can there be in a monopoly? The monopoly in my town couldn't just fire a teacher who sent sexual emails to his 16-year-old student. The school system isn't calcified just because it's a government monopoly. There's another stumbling block. The teachers united will never be defeated. It's a union-dominated monopoly. The muscle and the zeal that built our union is still with us. Teachers unions in this country are very influential because they want to get something done or stopped. They can assemble a crowd. 20,000 people and thousands more wanted to be here. Randy Weingarten heads New York City's teachers union. She put out the word and thousands of teachers filled Madison Square Garden to demand the new contract with more money. You are heroes! Some teachers are heroes, but not all. Most of the teachers, they like, they, they don't really care. One of my teachers tells me he does this for the health benefits. I've seen teachers come to school intoxicated. This seems odd because teachers I know want to help kids learn. Many turn down better paying jobs to teach. But in union schools, there's a problem. We tolerate mediocrity, and people get paid the same, whether they're outstanding or whether they're average, or indeed, whether they're way below average. Joel Klein is chancellor of New York City schools, the biggest public school system in the country. Fourth grade, 
a very big year. He says the teachers' union's rigid contract makes it very hard to fire any teacher, even dangerous ones. I mean, we've had sex cases, acknowledged sex cases. One teacher sent sexual emails to Cutie 101, his 16-year-old student. This is the most unbelievable case to me because the email was there. He admitted to it. It was so thoroughly offensive. And he confesses. He admits this. I mean, you have the email. He admits that he did it. You can't fire him? It's almost impossible. The school board says it's almost impossible to fire a teacher. Our union has actually stepped up to the plate and said, we'll police our own profession. Well, I'd like to police my job, too, but that's not how it works in Except life. Except that... Bosses make these decisions. If the cases are legitimate, they should bring them. There are procedures. It, it's, it's in the contract. If the teacher's incompetent, they can be let go. It takes years, years. These are the steps a principal must follow to fire a bad teacher. Look at this thing. The teachers union got so many protections to make sure principals don't fire unfairly or play favorites that principals rarely even try to jump through all these hoops to fire a bad teacher. In the last two years, said Klein, only two tenured teachers out of 50,000 had been fired for incompetence. It makes no sense. And you don't know other places where this goes on. This is not like you can say they're doing this at IBM or some other place, right? This is unique to our environment. I'm not sure I understand how to manage a government civil service organization. <laughs> GE's Jack Welch was revered as a great manager. He says if an organization is to stay vital, it must reward its best workers, and the bottom 10% have to go. We tell people in the bottom 10, look, you got a year. Find yourself somewhere to go. And they do. By doing that, he made GE unbelievably successful. But what he did at GE is forbidden at most public schools. We have a system in which we don't distinguish among people. And as a result of that, we don't reward excellence. Why don't you reward excellence? Because it's barred by the contract. Ah, yes, the union contract. Here it is, more than 200 pages of fine print. Union monopolies often create documents like this. It's not just 200 page contract. You got all these addenda that are incorporated into the contract. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages more. So it is a regulatory nightmare. So much so that he couldn't just fire that teacher who sent those sexual emails. Up, down, around, everywhere. We've paid him. He hasn't taught, but we have had to pay him because that's what's required under the contract. Paid him more than $300,000. Only after six years of expensive litigation were they finally able to fire him. Hundreds of teachers who the city calls incompetent, racist, dangerous, or guilty of sexual misconduct have been paid millions. And what do they do with those teachers? Well, they put them in the rubber room. It's what they call it. It's not really made of rubber, but it's a big empty room and this building and four other buildings around town. Because they don't want these teachers to get near the kids, so they just come here and sit. Hang around, read magazines, waste time, and waste your money. They wouldn't allow us to take pictures inside while the teachers were there. Today, the city pays $20 million a year to house teachers in rubber rooms. Insane as that is, at the union rally, teachers told me they support the firing rules. What if a principal says, you're a lousy teacher, they can say I want to fire you. That's not true, yeah, that's not right. You prove it. You prove I'm a bad teacher. And if you can't prove it, don't try it. Everywhere, unions resist the practice that made GE and other organizations successful. Weed out the bad. There aren't really bad teachers. The rules must stand, say unions everywhere. Wisconsin public schools are great schools. Test scores are up. The teachers' unions spend millions on ads saying the schools are great. There's an explosion of excellence in New York public schools. Since the schools are excellent, they say, don't mess around with our rules and benefits. Permit members to retire without penalty at age 55. Mm -hmm. Teachers would work uniform six hours and 40 minute days at all levels. Which is what normally happens in the private sector. Really? She says her teachers should work regular hours, but how many of you work a uniform six hour, 40 minute day? But the union is powerful. And a few months after our interview, Weingarten got a new contract. This is a really good day. Look at the smiles. In exchange for a 15% raise, the union made concessions. 
for example, they agreed to work 10 minutes a day longer. They say it will be easier to get rid of sex offenders, but it will still take all these steps to fire an incompetent teacher. Unionized monopolies like yours fail. In um, this, this case, it's the children who, are, who you are failing. We are not a unionized monopoly, and ultimately, those folks who want to say this all the time, they don't really care about kids. Those who criticize a monopoly don't care about kids? Please. But the union doesn't take criticism quietly. Several months after Stupid in America was originally broadcast, hundreds of union teachers showed up on our doorstep to point at me and say, shame on you. School problems aren't the union's fault, they said. There are other reasons kids struggle. If you wanted our kids to have a good education, you'd build more schools and make smaller classes. We are here to demand an apology from 2020's John Stossel for his anti-teacher, anti-union, and anti-public education piece of yellow journalism. Who are we? UFT! Who are we? UFT! The UFT, the United Federation of Teachers, said I was wrong to criticize the union. John Stossel is, has never taught in a classroom, yet he's an expert on education. I wanted to hear more, but the protesters drowned us out. Let's start listening! After an hour, the union president made me an offer. So just teach for a week. She said she'd arrange for me to lead a class for a week. They'd even help prepare me. That would educate me. The crowd liked that idea. And it sounded good to me. So I said, yes, I'll teach. I said they could pick any school, any kids. But then the school bureaucracy showed itself. After weeks of endless discussions, they decided our cameras would not be welcome. It's too bad. I understand why they said no. Sure, our cameras would have shown me struggling to teach and how difficult teaching can be. But who knows what else the cameras might have seen. When public schools began in America, most people worked on farms. It's why there's no school in summer, so kids could stay home and help with the crops. Today, fewer than 2% of us work on farms, and nearly everything in our society has changed dramatically. So why has there been so little change in education? We want to do what we want to do in classrooms. As we've seen, one reason is that unions fight to maintain the status quo. But that status quo often doesn't serve the kids. Our students are basically just dying in their seats at school. They're not getting the education they deserve, and the union puts up a barrier for that. These San Diego teachers fought to make their schools charter. Charter means they're still a public school, but they're free of many of the rules set up by school boards and unions. You got it, kiddo. Excellent. Okay. Now, when a teacher's hired, she knows if she doesn't do a good job, she can be fired. I'm a good teacher. I don't need tenure to protect my job. I need tenure to be gone to protect my students. The rule is given for each table. Since this school dropped the union rules, there's now a waiting list to get in. Many charter schools are succeeding. Friendship Charter High is located in the same dangerous part of Washington, D.C. as Baloo High, one of the city's poorest performing schools. The student populations are similar, mostly poor and minority. I think he's a good friend. But at the charter school, there is order. The kids are on task and doing better. 95% of the graduates get into college. Is this school better than the public high schools? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> well, why, why of course? The charter students recognize that their school is different. The teachers, they say, they're happier to be here. What does a hyperbola always have to have in it? This teacher got Rashawn Miller interested in math, a subject she used to hate. What'd she do differently? It, she makes it fun. She makes it fun. Danielle. Making it fun could help them keep their jobs. She's here because a third of the previous teachers were fired. I love teaching here. The best teachers make extra money. We can give bonuses. We can have Saturday school with pay. We can do summer school and reward certain teachers. The kids see the results. And people here care more? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Good morning, get the jacket off. The charter school's chief academic officer knows if his school doesn't perform, he's accountable. 
we can be closed. We can't settle for just being good enough. This makes charter schools innovate. And if the teammate asks for help, what do we do? Yeah. This one keeps kids in school till 5 p.m. Hello. And teachers give kids their cell phone yes. numbers. Hello. Hello, Ms. Hong. And in the evening, every teacher yes, must be available to answer yes. questions. I had a question on the, um, the review sheet. Okay. I get phone calls at all hours of the night. Hello. Teachers say the kids hey, call constantly. Hey, Christelle, what's up? So many kids want to get into those schools, the schools have to hold lotteries like this one. 3581051. The suspense is unbearable. I pray that they're going to pick on. So much is at stake. The winners get a shot at a better future. They spin the drum. Number 11. A look at that smile. Look at her smile. Listen to her delighted scream. Yay! But why do they have to win a lottery? If school money were attached to the child in the form of a voucher, every parent could take their child to new schools. Vouchers, no! Yes, yes! Vouchers, no! But lots of people hate vouchers. No public money for private schools! Earlier this year, a Florida court ruled against vouchers after this teacher brought a suit. To say that competition is going to improve education, it's just, it's just not going to work. You know, competition is not for children. It's not for human beings. It's not for public education. It never has been. It never will be. Why not? Would you keep going back to a restaurant that served you a bad meal? Or a barber that gave you a bad haircut? Competition makes everything better. Why would schools be different? In the few places where vouchers have been allowed, like Milwaukee, the kids who used vouchers did better, and the kids in nearby public schools did better. They improved by leaps and bounds. No one lost in Milwaukee. Everyone did better. The kids at the regular public schools did better, and the kids who went to the voucher schools did better. Of course they did. That's what competition does. Choice to me is the only way, I believe, that we can force the system from an external vantage point to change itself. It, it will never change itself from within. Public education will never change but all the reforms. These are well-intended people who want to help kids. All the well-intended designs and programs du jour, unless there is some competition infused in the equation, unless that occurs, then, then they know they have a captive monopoly that they can continue to dominate. Hands, please. But if there were competition, if parents had a choice, the possibilities of what we could have are limitless. Thanks for watching Stupid in America. And again, we're not saying the kids are stupid, but there's plenty about the system that is. We hope this starts a debate. I'm John Stossel. For all of us at 2020, good night.